Welcome to the 2023 ICRA conference towards more sustainable development, multilateral organizations and cultural relations in the 2030 agenda and beyond. We are delighted to have you with us for this session, which takes the format of a panel discussion and is entitled Understandings of Multilateralism in Different Regional Contexts. This is one of a number of online sessions taking place as part of the ICRA conference. Hopefully you will be able to join us for the rest of the panel discussions prepared for today. Um, let me first introduce myself. My name is Jimena Zapata. I am a researcher in the GIGA Institute, the German Institute for Global and Area Studies in Hamburg, Germany. And I have been invited by the ICRA network to moderate this session. Before I introduce our first speaker, let me say a few words about the ICRA and the overall aims for this, uh, of this conference. So ICRA stands for the International Cultural Relations Research Alliance. The ICRA network brings together global research and insights on the theory and practice of cultural relations. And when we talk about cultural relations, we are really talking about uh, ways of working internationally in the areas of uh, arts, education, and civil society to build trust and understanding, to promote collaboration, and to enhance and sustain dialogue between people and cultures. So with this conference, the aim is to put the network's knowledge about cultural relations into dialogue with experts on multilateralism and sustainable development. And this is done in the context of the UN Agenda 2030 and the UN Summit for the, of the Future's Call for the More Effective Multilateralism. And uh, we hope that the talks and the discussions over the course of the conference will help us better understand how cultural relations can support multilateral and regional organizations to deliver sustainable development. And yeah, we're very glad to have you all on board and to be part of these discussions. Uh, in this session, it's my pleasure to bring together Professor Thomas Legler, Professor Mandy Rukuni, and Dr. Paikyasoti Sarabanamutu, who will share their perspectives about how multilateralism is understood in their own regions. Latin America, Africa, and South Asia, uh, accordingly. I will briefly explain now how we will proceed. So first, I will give the floor to each of the panelists who will present a short statement of around eight minutes each. And then I will open the discussion around some of the key ideas raised by the, by the panelists. And this will also be a space in which the speakers, speakers will have the chance to further uh, deepen their thoughts and, and reflections. No? Our online audience will also have the opportunity to post questions to the speakers. So I do encourage the public to post your questions, comments, uh, reflections in the Q&A bo box as we go along and we'll aim to cover as many of these uh, uh, questions as we can uh, at the end of the session. So uh, yeah, without further instructions from my side, I want to welcome our first speaker, Professor Thomas Legler. Uh, professor Legler is a research uh, professor of international relations at the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. And he's a member of the National System of Researchers he has taught in several universities, including Mount Allison University, the University of Victoria, and the University of Toronto. For approximately 25 years, his research has focused on regional governance and institutions in Latin America. In this regard, he has published extensively on the organization of American states and the inter-American system, regional responses to political crisis in Honduras, Peru, and Venezuela, uh, Latin American uh, multilateralism, post-hegemonic uh, regionalism, the Pacific Alliance, and the COVID-19 pandemic governance. And uh, uh, he's currently preparing a book project on the rise of interpresidentialism as Latin America's dominant mode of regional governance. So thank you for being here with us, Professor Legler, and I leave the floor to you. 
Thank you very much, Jimena, and thank you to the organizers. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you, although it's just after three o'clock in the morning. Um, what I'd like to do with the time I have at the beginning here is to address the question, is there a Latin American way of doing or conducting multilateralism? And I would like to suggest that there are a set of common um, common practices uh, regarding multilateralism in the region. Um, first of all, I think it, we can speak about interpresidentialism. And I'd like to say, by the way, that uh, I'm guessing that my esteemed colleagues uh, from South Asia and from Africa uh, will find some of what I'm about to say quite familiar. Uh, so first of all, um, particularly since the 1980s, we've seen uh, a rising role for presidents, the projection of their authority through multilateral fora, uh, their own direct protagonism frequently uh, within multilateral decision-making within the region. We've also seen in recent decades a growing informalization trend, that is uh, a growth in the number of informal regional organizations without a solid footing in international public law and without a permanent secretariat. We also see a preference for pooling over delegation, that is a preference for uh, multilateral forums more as parliamentary fora rather than as uh, independent actors. And in this regard, we see among a lot of countries uh, and their actors a reluctance to delegate sovereign authority to regional organizations. So in this regard, we see regional organizations more as instruments than actors. And this towards often a common goal, uh, what has been called in the literature regime boosting, that is uh, multilateralism that is constructed to strengthen the hand of these executives in their own country more than to, to create strong regional institutions that set rules uh, for uh, influence in their behavior. And we also see a preference here for what we might call a la carte multilateralism. That is multilateralism where uh, those players who engage in it across the region prefer to have a significant amount of wiggle room or room for maneuver and the ability to pick and choose options uh, as they please. We also see a strong trend of contested multilateralism. This should come as no surprise since um, uh, within this region, if we if we look at it in a broader hemisphere conte uh, context, we see the United States, but also towards external powers. This idea that multilateralism provides opportunities for soft balancing and institutional balancing against these powers and the organizations which they have traditionally dominated or in which they have commanding influence. Uh, it has often been observed that there is also a reluctance for a, num a number of these countries and their governments to serve as the paymasters. Uh, so this serves often as something of an impediment to create a stronger, more formal institutions. As well, traditionally, we see um, multilateralism as quite an elitist endeavor with a, a a strong anti-civil society participation bias. But I, I'm pleased to report that in recent years, this seems to be changing quite quickly. I think a key cleavage to take into consideration in the Latin American region is uh, with, uh, with respect to regional multilateral governance architecture is the nexus of uh, the inter-American system as a set of multilateral organizations and institutions on the one side and Latin American, Caribbean, regional and sub-regional organizations on the other. And historically, um, something of, um, of um, tradition of ups and downs in terms of the interaction of, of these two sets of institutions and the nexus between them. Uh, on a final note, I just want to say that uh, I think in recent years, outsiders have viewed the region with the sense uh, that there's something which has been called diminished multilateralism, that there is an increasing lack of principled multilateralism across the region. I think this is something of a simplification 
I think um, there's certainly an instrumental attitude when it comes to multilateralism, but that, of course, is reflected across different regions and also both regionally and globally. I think rather um, multilateralism has long served as the basis for protecting a set of shared principles across the region. And here we can talk about sovereignty, about executive privilege, um, self-determination, non-intervention, and so forth. Um, that concludes my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insights uh, yeah, about the current trends in multi multilateralism in, in Latin America. Uh, yeah, Professor Leger has touched upon a uh, uh, Latin American uh, way of doing of doing multilateralism no? and some of the of its characteristics. No? Uh, he mentioned, for instance, uh, informalization. No? Um, yeah, I'm sure we will return to this to these ideas during the discussion with the with the audience. But for now, I want to welcome our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Sara Banamutu, who will address the topic of multilateralism from the perspective of South Asia. Thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on this important subject. As the previous speaker said, yes, there are certain similarities in terms of South Asia with Latin America, and I'm sure there may well be with Africa too. I think the point about multilateralism is that it takes place in a context in which you have sovereign states who are both aware that their notion of sovereignty is not what it was in 1648 or whatever, when this international system came into being, but at the same time, they want to insist that it is. In the South Asian context, we have those asymmetries of power at that international level because India is the key. India with its 1.4 billion population and its emergence as a world power and with the center of gravity in the balance of power in the world supposedly moving to Asia. It has issues with every other single South Asian state. And as far as regional cooperation is concerned, you have the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation SAC, as we call it by shorthand. The Indian position is that no bilateral issues should get to the SARC agenda, that they need to be resolved bilaterally. And as a consequence, SARC is in an invidious position of either being totally irrelevant or something that is putatively relevant because it's a thing of the future when everyone can agree and live in peaceful coexistence, as it were, then SARC might well come into its own. I think the issue with, with multi multilateralism is the issue of the backlash against globalization. You know, it is because of this notion that globalization has removed, in effect, the barriers of sovereignty and all of that, that those within those domestic national jurisdictions want to make a claim, want to reassert their notions of identity. And it is that populism that I think has been uh, demonstrated from the Trump era in the United States to Modi in India and indeed to the Rajapaksas in my own country, whereby the notion is, is that we have to go back into the past, we have to either make America great again or make our identity strongly felt, because without them, we just pale into insignificance as citizens of the world. We lose our distinctiveness, we lose our identity. Now, if at the level of the states, 
there is a problem of power and resources with regard to pushing multilateralism. At the level of civil society, the problem is no different. One, because civil society has to cope with the dominance of the state. If you look at India today, civil society is on the back foot. It's on the defensive. Financial regulations and laws have been used to curb the space for civil society to function. In my own country, in Sri Lanka, the government is threatening legislation to register civil society organizations and thereby restrict their room for maneuver. But that's at the organizational level. In our countries, we also have a situation in which the borders are porous. Ordinary people do engage with each other. But to call that multilateralism, I think, would be a bit far-fetched, although it putatively sets the groundwork or the basis for it into the future. Now, as was said, as far as Latin America is concerned, the populism and the authoritarianism of the executive is something that we are acutely aware of, and we've had unprecedented demonstrations of civil society against that and against the, those strong consolidated institutions of executive authority and convenience breeding corruption. Yeah. And as a consequence of that, I think we may well move now into a situation in which the prospects for multilateralism may increase gradually, where people in society recognize that autonomy is important, but nevertheless, there's a fundamental interdependence, which cannot be denied. And that that independence probably does require institutions to facilitate and foster it. I mentioned the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. In our part of the world, we move beyond that. We've gone to BIMSTEC. We also have another organization called IORA, which is about the Indian Ocean region. We have a proliferation of organizations which effectively end up as talking shops without much action on their part. But as long as they exist, I think within them reside the hope that multilateralism will have a renaissance, if you like, in the future. So let me end my opening remarks with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saravanamuntu. I just realized that actually I didn't present your, your profile to the audience, so I would like to, to, to do it now. Uh, yeah, for the public, for the audience, yeah, Dr. Saravanamuntu is an economist and founder executive director of the Center for Policy Alternatives. He currently is a member of the board and bureau of South Asians for Human Rights and a member of the board of South Asia Regional Office of Amnesty International. Uh, in 2010, he was awarded the inaugural Citizens uh, Peace Award by the National Peace Council of Sri Lanka. And in September 2013, he was invited by President Obama to attend his high level event on civil society in New York. In 2016, he was appointed secretary of the task force on consultations on mechanisms for reconciliation. He is also a founder director of the Sri Lanka chapter of Transparency International and a, and a founding uh, co convener of the Center for Monitoring Election Violence and the Civil Society Alliance uh, uh, Platform for Freedom. And finally, yeah, he's an alumni of the London School of Economics and Political Science, uh, University of London, where he was awarded a PhD in international uh, relations. 
yeah thank you very much for your for your thank reflections you. for your insights on the on the south asian region and now i would like to present to our audience our last speaker professor mandy rukuni and say some words about his profile and 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 work so professor rukuni is an agricultural economist he's author of the books being african and leading africa uh, published by Penguin, and of various works in the field of agriculture, land tenure, and uh, food security. He was the former Dean of Agriculture at the University of Zimbabwe, and is currently the director of the Barefoot uh, Edu Education Africa Trust. So, Professor Rukoni, thank you for, for joining us in this panel. I give you the floor. You have uh, eight minutes. Thanks. Thank you so much, <clears throat> and my apologies. I uh, I traveled and forgot to bring my headphones. So, if uh, I'm not clear, just let me know. Now, I'm I'm actually uh, grateful uh, to have listened to my colleagues um, from uh, uh, Latin America and Asia, because as you. Uh, uh, aptly say they there are so many similarities when it comes to this issue of multiculturalism and it's it's just that Africa is probably struggling with it much more than the other uh, regions uh, and the main reason is because uh, of course it's totally historical in a sense that uh, Africa's experience with colonialism was different in in some respects, which still impact strongly on the formation of nation states. And 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 then the, the, the notion of uh, Western style uh, uh, state uh, uh, democracy and, and how that creates options and opportunities for original integration. Uh, so uh, it's taken, um, Africa 60 years uh, post the major part of colonialism to 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 start uh, dealing with this issue uh, in ways that may eventually start impacting on sustainable development but the globalization probably has a much bigger impact on Africa uh, because uh, of uh, if as I say the Africa's stage in trying to figure out how to get the, the the original bodies to really form an Africa union that truly represents uh, an African voice. So the, the, the culturally speaking, um, uh, Africans have struggled uh, over the over the last uh, uh, 60 years or so to translate a lot of what we have, you know, rich cultural uh, heritage around all issues from 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 self governance to economic uh, transformation. We all had all this stuff uh, historically, but it has failed to trickle back into into any of the societal systems, including elements of uh, original cooperation and multiculturalism, and uh, that that means that there's a lot of mimicry. Uh, at all levels, uh, in fact, it's so it's, it's it's quite bad. Although it's beginning to change, I could say from family uh, systems to community systems to national systems and regional cooperation, we have had um, what you might call uh, 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 double lives uh, in Africa uh, during the day we are kind of like half Europeans, you know, and, and, and then at night we, 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 we are more African and trying to figure out how we are going to build a, uh, um, re or re rebuild uh, all these uh, societal systems in, in ways that allow for uh, stronger self-governance, self-reliance and so on. So globalization uh, continues to impact on uh, uh, how uh, if, if, if we start with the three uh, uh, main sectors of our societies uh, in terms of governance, uh, I think my colleagues mentioned the state machinery itself, 
uh, private sector uh, uh, and civil society. A civil society in Africa is, is largely foreign organizations posing on behalf of Africans uh, as civil society, because Africans historically had, we had our own national structures where civil society was much more integrated into all aspects uh, of life. So, so because our economies are still at the bottom of the ladder, not not one African country out of 55, not one is even uh, fully industrialized, um, uh, 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 high income economy. We we have low low income and some middle income, and a, our best uh, industrialized nation is South Africa. Uh, 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 is a member of the BRICS, and uh, in a sense, the the repositioning of the global geopolitics with the BRICS challenging uh, what we as Africans always felt like was multilateral, multicultural uh, uh, entities which are dominated by uh, by Western civilization and Western governments everything from the United Nations to how we experience uh, uh, what you might call, the, the, and a good example was COVID, uh, where quite clearly the, 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 the Western uh, uh, notion of a health system uh, is defined by the United States and, and the whole pharmaceutical industry is defined by the FDA and the United States. That leading to uh, for the first time in a long time, Africans realizing that our own traditional systems of health uh, were probably much more helpful in, in preventative health and, and, and how we survived COVID is still a puzzle for most of us in Africa because the systems were telling us to get vaccinated and to do all the things that our governments were pretending are important to do. So this mimicry really uh, pervades all aspects of uh, uh, multilateralism and uh, Africa still is struggling to even have, even with a newly fashioning out geopolitical space with uh, quite clearly the BRICS is, is, is given us Africans a new kind of sense of maybe we can reposition ourselves and have more independent, more uh, a sovereign uh, kind of thinking nation and maybe one day a, a, a common foreign policy on a lot of issues that affect Africans. So I think I'll leave it at that for my opening statements. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Rocconi, for this very interesting uh, uh, statement. So uh, yeah, our three speakers have given us uh, plenty of insights regarding this connection of yeah, multilateralism, regional organizations in Latin America, Africa, and South Asia, and uh, about the civil society, no? So yeah, thank you very much to the three speakers for your initial statements. So now I would like to move to the second part of, the, of this panel, which consists of an open uh, discussion with the speakers around some of the uh, ideas that they that they presented no so uh, yeah i want to remind also the online audience that you can post the questions in the q and i box yeah if possible stating your affiliation and to whom you direct your your questions or if these questions are addressed to to all speakers so um, yeah, I would actually like to to start uh, with this discussion by bringing to our conversation yeah the topic of multilateralism you now as viewed through the perspectives of the three different uh, regions represented by our our panelists. Um, I would like to 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 start by um, listening to the speaker's opinion regarding. Yeah, in, in broad terms, you now the the intrinsic value that their respective regions place on multilateralism itself. Now, so let's focus at this point on the like general value of multilateralism. 
maybe later in a subsequent part of our discussion, we will delve into the like regional perceptions of the current multilateral system of governance and its practice. But uh, for now, the question would be, uh, what is the value that your regions assign to multilateralism per se? Or uh, in other words, uh, to what extent does multilateralism resonate you now with the historical and cultural values of your uh, of your region? Um, can we start with um, Professor Legler? Sure, of course. Um, is there a common understanding of multilateralism in the region of your expertise? Uh, in my opening remarks. Um, I wanted to suggest that, yes, there are a series of clear patterns of how uh, Latin American practitioners uh, and thinkers uh, try to construct la uh, multilateralism, both within the region and as they approach uh, global multilateralism. But at the same time, I'd like to say that my answer to this would be both a yes and a no. Uh, I, I think importantly, as, as I tried to stress uh, in my opening comments, uh, there is a broad perception, obviously, uh, influenced by ongoing asymmetries of power, both within the hemisphere and globally, that multilateralism has served uh, as a series of arenas for contestation and containment of the global north by the global south. And I think this continues, even, even among those countries that align themselves with frequency, uh, with certain frequency with the United States, we see moments where um, there's uh, there's something of a solidarity among different countries in terms of uh, the treatment they wish to receive uh, and the sense uh, of promoting an equality uh, and the need to look at multilateralism as an opportunity to to equalize the the uh, global structure of power. At the same time, I think uh, multilateralism represents, uh, importantly, um, a system of institutions for upholding international law. And I think here, Latin American thinkers, practitioners, actors, hist historically have played an important role as both contributors and norm entrepreneurs to a number of leading uh, norms, both within the region and, and globally, here, of course, I'm speaking about sovereignty, self-determination, non-intervention, peaceful resolution of conflict. Uh, importantly, uh, some important inter-American institutions existed even prior to uh, the birth of the United Nations system uh, and were an inspiration in, in the creation of the United Nations system. At the same time, as I said, uh, my answer is both yes and no. I think there's also important differentiation <laughs> I think a constant uh, historically has been the difficulty in, in achieving Latin American unity. So what we see is often some countries have traditionally been aligned closely with the United States, although even among some of these countries, for example, in Central America, uh, at present, we see some distancing between these traditional partners uh, and the United States. At the same time, in recent years, we've seen the rise once again of advocacy for an active non-alignment position within uh, Latin America vis-a-vis -vis external powers. The idea here being uh, that Latin America, in sort of, instead of taking positions uh, in favor of the United States, for example, or China or Russia, uh, would prefer to maintain uh, a diversity of relations among or with these different countries. And certainly other countries, as we know, uh, have much more pronounced anti-US and anti-imperialist positions. Uh, as a final reflection, just I just wanted to mention that there has also been a lack of consensus on how the United Nations system should be reformed, and in particular, the Security Council. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Leger. Um, I would like to, to ask um, Dr. Sarabanamutu if you see some parallels uh, uh, regarding um, the, these trends in Latin American multilateralism that Professor uh, Leger has mentioned, and also back to this question of 
um, what is the value that 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 South Asia assigned to 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 multilateralism, and, or to what extent does multilateralism resonate with the cultural and historical values of of, of your region? Yes, I mean there are a great deal of uh, similarities, but I think at the end of the day, the notion of multilateralism within the region. Uh, depends very much also on the purpose, the perceptions of power among the states themselves. You know, India is quite clearly the dominant power in the region. And India's notions of multilateralism with its smaller neighbors is always, you know, grappling with this thing, you know, can a giant behave like a dwarf? Because the expectations of the others are that the giant should behave like a dwarf, that they suffer inequality of states. But that is obviously a myth in practice. When it comes to civil society as well, I mean, you know, civil society, like political parties as well, you know, you have the good, the bad, and the ugly. Insofar as there are those who promote and believe in multilateralism, and there are those who are ultra-nationalists, I would say even rapidly ultra-nationalists, who are opposed to the idea of multilateralism because they say that they will lose their identity, they will lose their autonomy, they will lose their sovereignty. So multilateralism is therefore seen as the kind of cat's paw of the greater balance of power. And in the South Asian region, that of course is India now being seen as at one level more closely aligned to the United States and the various uh, military security alliances to contain or combat growing Chinese influence in that region. But also on the other hand, the attempt on the part of the government in India to be able to strike out on its own in terms of say key issues like Ukraine and the uh, Hamas-Israeli conflict at the present moment to carve out independent positions. So as I said to you before, I mean, it is multilateralism is there in the region. It depends on whom you're talking to. And as long as there is that division of opinion and perception at the present moment, there hopefully will be hope for it in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Saravana Mutu. Um, I would like to hear um, uh, Professor Mande Rukuni's reflections on this uh, particular uh, question from the African perspective. So the uh, same, same questions uh, that you posed uh, for, so can you come? Can you... Can you explain again? Uh -huh. So yeah, like the same question, like what would be, what what is the value that the, in this case, uh, Africa or African institutions assigned to multilateralism per se, to what extent does multilateralism resonate with uh, cultural values or the historical uh, values of your region? Right. So we have um, in Africa, uh, what you might call um, in, instead of uh, one dominant um, uh, country like India is in the region in Africa, it's, it's a little bit more distributed, but we do have similar effect than what I've had on Asia in the sense that in, 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 in Southern Africa is South Africa, in East Africa is Kenya, and in uh, West Africa is Nigeria. And in North Africa, it's Egypt. So, so, and uh, and all, all those regions uh, uh, do feel the effects of the regional superpower because it cuts across everything. Because because we're struggling uh, with broad-based development, broad-based structural transformation. So, what happens is. Uh, the uh, the effect of the regional superpower is is basically that they they will invariably uh, uh, behave uh, with self interest uh, on across the board whether it's um, 
its issues of uh, rich security or its issues of uh, regional trade and integration or simply dealing with uh, peace and security type issues. The, 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 uh, the, the, the desire to, um, to be economically uh, uh, more powerful uh, is the model that uh, in Africa we have borrowed from Western civilization that the, the one who can mete out the greatest violence, the one who does have the military power is the one who's gonna determine uh, almost everything else, including uh, the, the how society functions, the, the, the cultural aspects. So globalization is being distributed in Africa at a local level. It's, it's globalization, but basically it's not globalization. It's just dominant, a dominant uh, culture or nation gobbling up the rest or trying to. So, so you're going to you're going to see uh, that issues of sovereignty are used uh, uh, by all African nations also to protect self-interest. There are times when uh, it is very important to promote uh, regional cooperation and multilateralism because it's seen as a way to probably pro promote economic development. But the next issue comes up and. You know, this, uh, sovereignty is put across as the main reason why the next donor neighbors should not intervene in, uh, in, in domestic affairs of, of another nation. And usually also that impacts issues of governance, uh, peace and security and so on. So we are, we are kind of uh, learning as we go. And uh, we are conscious in Africa, I think, that um, the, the, the global repositioning, uh, 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 a, a a kind of a uni uh, uh, model or single uh, global superpower policing everybody is something Africans have been looking forward to going away as soon as possible. Af to put it simply in political terms, Africans would like to see five, six global superpowers in the next two decades so that we, we, have, we have capacity to have more uh, 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 genuine relationships with uh, 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 a plethora of global superpowers, and in our own case, then be able to 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 have better regional cooperation, allowing us to see the rest of the world uh, in terms of being Africans, positioning ourselves to, 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 to excel in all areas, even our products. We don't manufacture much. If we're going to be a manufacturing continent, it has to be African products. We have to be selling our culture. We have to sell our wares. We can never be uh, as good as India or China or United States by copy, copy, copying everybody else. I mean, you copy to a certain point, but copy intelligently, but bring out what's African. That's what we're struggling with. Would, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Rocconi. Um, yeah, I would like to move to another point that has to do with the um, regional perceptions now about the practices and the actual dynamics of the current multilateral system of governance and its institutions. Now, so. We see that in the last decades, there seems to be a sort of consensus no, regarding the crisis of, of uh, multilateralism or the inability of the present uh, uh, liberal rules-based order to address and provide solutions no, to the uh, world's most pressing issues. Um, let's say a failure to deal with, with conflicts and maintaining peace to like inability to address uh, global economic um, inequalities no, that we find in in these three three regions for east for instance no so the question would be like what is the general perception in your in your region or the most salient uh, views in your region about the effectiveness and relevance of the culture of the current uh, multilateral system in addressing uh, global challenges um are there like widespread concerns about uh, the system's ability to provide solutions to pressing issues that affect uh, your region of expertise? Whoever wants to jump in in this question is uh, <laughs> is fine. 
Well, maybe it's easiest for me uh, just to start off again. Um, well, I just want to reiterate, uh, I think multilateralism has historically been a vocation or perceived as a vocation among Latin American countries and actors. Um, and I think that's still very, very much present. I think we've only seen exceptionally uh, this phenomenon of um, uh, a type of nationalism that is at the same time anti-multilateral. Uh, one of these exceptions was uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, who who recently, the year last year, was defeated by Lula. So with his uh, exit from the stage uh, at this moment, um, there are few, if any, countries or governments in the region that are um, are um, strongly critical in the sense of wanting to disengage from that multilateral system. Um, indeed, I think what we see is a number of countries uh, have been uh, very enthusiastic about supporting recent efforts such as the Alliance for Multilateralism coordinated by uh, France and, and Germany uh, to to defend that system and and to advocate for its reform and strengthening. And, and here we can speak of Argentina, Chile, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Mexico, Peru. At the same time, uh, I think there's also historically, in this, and especially at present, a, uh, a reluctance to be pulled into uh, political games, which they perceive as as Western games or or superpower intrigues, so in this regard, uh, we've seen quite clearly a reluctance to to take sides uh, regarding the war in Ukraine. So, uh, I think uh, almost uh, in a united way, there is certainly a concern about the violation of certain norms, but uh, a a very very pronounced reticence to be perceived as supporting one side or another uh, in this con in this conflict. Uh, in recent years, there's been an increase in the number of, of left-wing governments across uh, the region to the extent that uh, reporters and observers started speaking about another pink tide or a pink tide 2.0 um, as a sort of second incarnation of a, of a wave of left-wing governments after the first one at the at the beginning of the, the new millennium. Uh, I would say that this is uh, this is present, but at the same time, there are important exceptions, and there's certainly very much ups and downs in terms of um, the electoral uh, fortunes from one country to another. But certainly, among this set of center-left leaning governments, there is this continued interest in pushing for a multipolarization uh, of of global governance and uh, and a greater influence for the global South. Um, at the same time, we see individual countries like Brazil, uh, especially now uh, under the leadership of Lula, once again, uh, advocating for an increased leadership role for uh, BRICS countries. And we may see shortly uh, Argentina join that club. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Leger. Uh, um... Could you, Professor uh, Saravanamoto, would you like to to, to yeah. tell us, um, yeah, about like what specific concerns or criticisms have been voiced by your region or the countries in in your region regarding the the current multilateral system uh, are in connection to to what Professor uh, Leger said, uh, are there also like calls towards like multipolarization of, of global global uh, governance? Yeah, I think the, the attitude towards uh, multilateralism stems from sort of seeing the United Nations, if you like, as the epitome of, of a multilateral body. And of course, the question of the asymmetry of the institutions, the Security Council and the General Assembly, prevail. And as you know, there are the calls for reform of the membership of the Security Council. And India is at the forefront of that on the grounds that it is an economic power, it is a huge population, it's also a nuclear power. And therefore, there are no needs, there are no reasons to exclude it. But however, within the region, of course, Pakistan would object to India being a member of the Security Council. 
So the nation state animosities and rivalries and competition always impede the growth of and what might appear to be the obvious logical growth of multilateralism. I think the, the issue here is, is that the way that it has proceeded in the past is one of a perception that it is a Western dominated process, you know, and until one can get rid of that, I think there's always going to be problems in pursuing it further. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I actually would like to read one, one uh, comment, one question by James uh, Perkins. Uh, and he says, um, if we're moving towards a multipolar world with a number of competing superpowers, what role do shared uh, values play, if any, in shaping how multilateral organizations engage with these uh, giants? And how does this play out in different parts of the, of the world? Uh, would you like to give some reflections on this uh, on this question or what we were previously uh, discussing, uh, Professor uh, Rukuni? Sure, I'd, I'd like to respond to that, but I'm tempted to start off by just make, making a small comment on the last question because in the case of Africa, the 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 most interesting thing for Africa was. Uh, the clearest response by Africans was triggered by the uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, for, for a very interesting reason of uh, sanctions. When the Americans on that system started applying economic sanction, uh, then most African countries who, are, who have been experiencing sanctions for a long time for different reasons <laughs> began to kind of voice this from a much more political angle to say that well, if, if, a, if, a, if, if a regional superpower such as Russia can, can be placed with sanctions, you know, um, this world is going to be very difficult for the poorest countries, which are mostly in Africa. And so the, the, the rethinking around that is what actually is motivated most, in my opinion, most African countries. So in a multipolar world, they, they definitely have to be shared values which the United Nations has failed to uphold. And I would put them in three, I, I think it's three categories of values. Uh, the, uh, one is a mutual respect of all cultures and nations and uh, belief systems. But, but without mutual respect uh, guaranteed in a, uh, a re reformed United Nations or a new multipolar world, then we'll still be stuck with with attempts by dominant uh, nations to 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 force feed their own uh, cultures on others. So regional, sorry, uh, mutual respect is the first. Mutual benefit is the second, because mutual benefit has to be redefined. Uh, uh, going beyond SDGs because it's not it's it, the mutual benefit really comes down to some yeah some elements of the SDGs how we protect the commons uh, we we there's absolutely no shared value around how we are going to protect the the environment how we are going to reduce conflict and and so on and so on so I'd say mutual a uh, 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 benefit uh, would 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 refer to coming together to ensure we collectively are going to protect this world. Finally, it's basically mutual responsibilities, and 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 I think the failure of the uh, General Assembly and, uh, and and Security Council to 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 protect everyone in the world <laughs> and and self interest still prevailing is something that should be informed by a shared value of mutual accountability and mutual responsibility. That would be mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me see if we have some more questions from the audience. Yeah, I, I will read the question by uh, Rosanna Levis. 
And she says, with the UN Summit of the Future taking place next year, uh, how do we ensure values of mutual respect, mutual benefit, and mutual uh, responsibilities are driving the policies and frameworks uh, to come? Uh, which nations are platforming these values at this at this forum? So, uh, yeah, now there is also this question of the yeah, relationship between like multilateralism, regional organizations, and their own notions of. Uh, of development, so I think this question is linked to, to yeah, like um, development and uh, um, so. Um, could Professor Legra tell us some reflections on this on this question, the link with the uh, development? Um, well, actually, I I, I was interested in uh, making a link with the last question. I, I think there's a, a common perception that multilateral, uh, multipolarization opens opportunity, uh, and specifically uh, promoting really much more the possibility of of uh, a real equality uh, among countries rather than um, just de jure or, or 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 paper equality. In addition, in Latin America historically. Uh, autonomy has been um, an ongoing aspiration uh, of all countries. And uh, I think there's a broader perception that multipolarization uh, opens up much more uh, real, real opportunities for for advancing both national and regional autonomy. Um, and I would say at the same time that uh, multipolarization is also consistent with uh, an ongoing imperative across the region in mere material terms. And here we can speak about development uh, to, to diversify economic relations of different types uh, on a global scale. So uh, I think in general, uh, even for those countries that uh, align themselves more closely with, uh, with one or other of the emerging poles in this planet, uh, there is a broader sense that uh, multi multipolarization um, benefits uh, a lot of different countries. Um, I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps Dr. Saravanamutu can say like some reflections on yeah, yeah, I... either the multi the benefits or if you see some benefits of multipolarization in your region uh -huh. yeah just i wanted to address myself to this question of you know how do you ensure the values of mutual respect mutual benefit and responsibilities driving these policies and frameworks i mean i think the issue at the present moment in most parts of the world if not all is the question of mutual respect, mutual benefit, and mutual responsibilities of the citizens within those countries. You know, Professor Avishan Madhuri wrote this book called The Decent Society, and he talked about a society in which institutions do not humiliate citizens and citizens do not humiliate each other. And I think that is the issue. It is about the social equality and justice back at home, and that's being translated internationally, that's going to make the difference. And I think, therefore, you know, there is no substitute for the freedom of expression of the popular will, and whether it be demonstrations in the street, but hopefully not with violence. But when there is a sense of all of these things not being acknowledged, not being fostered, then I think we have to take things into our own hands in terms of average citizens. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Professor uh, Rukuni, I just read your uh, your your, your comments yeah, in, the, in the chat. So. Yeah, uh, my apologies, because now I, I, because I've been traveling and now I have to head for the airport. Uh, I just didn't want to miss the conference, but I knew it was going to be a bit tight. But my apologies, I have to run. 
No, thank you. Thank you very much for 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 joining us uh, here. Uh, good luck with your with your work and have a safe uh, safe trip. Thank you for joining us. Bye. 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 Okay, so yeah, continuing with our um, discussion. Um, yeah, uh, both both of the of the speakers mentioned some of the regional organizations that uh, are the most uh, prominent in in Latin America in South Asia. Uh, for example, Professor uh, Dr. Sara Banamotu talked about the South Asian Association for Regional Regional uh, Cooperation, for example, and and the question goes um, in this direction: no? uh, How do regional organizations in South Asia and Latin America define and prior prioritize development? No? What are the key development goals and challenges they 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 focus they focus on? Well, if I might step in with regard to South Asia, I think that as far as South Asia is concerned, there is now much more of a consensus as to what development should be. And that consensus is moving away from the sort of left of center much more to the center. But in terms of utilizing that consensus for collective action, of course, that would depend largely upon the resources that the member states have and the extent to which they're willing to pool those resources. I mean, you take India, for example. India is going to be, what, second, third largest economy and all of that. But within India, the states of southern India believe that they have been subsidizing the North for quite some time and that their politics in that respect is somewhat different. So given that there is the whole sort of uh, majoritarian ideology of the current government in India, there is the prospect of confederation happening or the arguments for confederation have been given a boost by what's happening on the ground. So I think the, the, the problem here is, is that whilst there might be a much larger consensus with regard to development, how it is going to be pursued is going to depend very much on the power capabilities and resources of the country's concerned. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And perhaps, Professor uh, Leger, do you also see that in Latin America there is, um, like, um, like in the South Asia case, like this consensus towards uh, notions of uh, of development? How do different uh, regional organizations define or prioritize development? Or yeah, we can even go broader. Like, what is the region's perception about the sustainable development goals, for example? I think there are uh, contradictory tendencies uh, at present. Uh, I, I think I think there is a a widespread consensus on the sustainable development goals. I, I'm wondering in some ways if it's really um, global forums versus versus regional forums, which uh, which really helps to explain these contradictions in in perspectives about development. But uh, for example, it seems to me that there has been an ongoing, um, often quite acrimonious debate uh, regarding neoliberalism and 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 then promotion of market friendly policies for a number of decades now since the 1980s, um, and that continues uh, across the region. Um, and there seems to be uh, within within the region and here I, I want to expand the region in, in a more hemispheric direction um, perceptions uh, among a number of countries uh, uh, of sort of neoliberal and in quotation marks, neoliberal style uh, development policies or development uh, agenda as associated with, with uh, U S uh, influence and, and hegemony um, versus um 
other possibilities. At the same time, there's been the entry of new uh, new tendencies that that reflect uh, what's going on geopolitically on a global and a regional scale. So, nearshoring has has become a, a growing part of of the discourse. This idea of um, possibilities of of countries. Uh, aligning with the United States um, to to replace uh, distant suppliers, in particular China. Um, so, so there are, there are a number of different things that are going on in, in this regard. It, another contradiction that I find is is um, is that whereas there seems to be a, a, a general uh, a general uh, appreciate appreciation for the need um to diversify economies um we see with what's happening in terms of the in increase in in certain global commodity prices uh, we see yet once again latin american countries turning um towards um development models which are are reliance on or or choose to exploit um, natural um, natural resources, um, primary primary commodity exports, uh, neo extractivism activities in mining. So it, it seems that the discourse uh, often is is contradictory to what so a critical discourse is often contradictory to what um, in the previous decade was described as Latin America's commodity consensus. Um, on sustainability, I, I, I think uh, there is, is growing um, discourse, but uh, very, very different uh, between rhetoric and, and practice from one country to another. I live in Mexico, and, and what we see here is, is a government that... Uh, whose record is absolutely abysmal when it comes to uh, its commitments to sustainable development um, and the struggle against uh, climate change. Uh, this is a government that has actually increased its reliance on, on fossil fuels and, and their exploitation. So it, it's, I would say that there's not one single pattern, but uh, a number of, of contradictory things that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your insights. And now I would like to, I think I have some, some questions from the, from the audience, so I will actually read uh, some of them. Uh, for instance, um, Rosanna Levis um, says, I would agree with Dr. Saravanamutu. It does feel like if citizens are struggling to unite and look after each other at a local level, how do we how do we do this at a national or global level? At the same time, the multilateral policies and frameworks have provided human rights uh, and standards that help hold people accountable and decide uh, on the future track we take collectively. It is a bit chicken and egg as to what informs people's behaviors, perceptions, and actions at a local level, as they are large, largely driven by the media, politics, and the private sector with a focus on 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 money and and, and power. So this is uh, this is Rosanna uh, Levin's uh, comments. Um, perhaps if you want to comment on that or or expand more. Uh, uh, broadly on this. Or I can also like move to to because there are there are several several questions right now um that I find in the in the chat. Uh, for instance yeah, James uh, Perkins, he asks the question, how is digital technology impacting on how citizens perceive multilateralism? Are citizens of country X now more connected with their peers in other countries? Is this changing understandings of, of multilateralism? 
whoever would like to jump in in this question is fine. Yeah, um, certainly, I think there's uh, digital technology opens uh, all sorts of political opportunities. I think we all recognize that. In in some of the prepared comments that I had, I certainly uh, wanted to reflect that uh, that there seems in Latin America to be uh, Latin America has, has undergone now approximately ten years of of stagnation in in terms of of regional cooperation, uh, and it just seems now that there are possibilities that it comes out of this period. So, whereas relations among national leaders have often been strained, and that has served as an impediment for for broader regional multilateral cooperation, I think we've started to see some very, very interesting grassroots grassroots type of uh, political activism that is being connected in in quasi multilateral ways. So here I'm thinking, for example, for example of of para diplomacy uh, among cities. So there are a series of, of uh, different networks of cities that have, have arisen on everything from um, intercultural education. I, ha I have a list here of, of these very interesting different uh, possibilities that we've seen, um, sports and development, uh, creative cities, um, Cid, um, Red Mundial de Ciudades del Aprendizaje, uh, citizens of uh, city, cities of learning, um, bio diversities um, with the Latin American uh, and Caribbean Development Bank. So certainly, I, I think that digital technologies um, have opened up this possibility for non traditional actors to to complexify uh, the possibilities of multilateralism. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, Dr. Saravanamont, do you also see that digital technology is impacting uh, citizens in, in your region, in, in South Asia? And if digital technology, technology is changing this, understandings of multilateralism. Do you see some parallels with uh, what um, Professor Legger has mentioned of this? Um, he mentioned, for instance, uh, creative cities or para di diplomacy among among citizens. Uh, citizens. What, it is, what is your perception on this? Yes, I mean, as far as I, I see digital technology, particularly AI, that they are basically instruments. It is who uses them and for to you know understand that it happens within a political framework. Civil society too also falls within that political framework. There are those who are pro and constructive, and those who are very negative in their comments, and you have the rise of hate speech and disinformation and all of that kind of thing. You know, so I think it is very much, therefore, a question of who is using it and for what purpose. But I think more than that for South Asia, we have to come around understanding what the uses of this technology can be and also having access to it. Now, I know that, you know, the more technologies you develop into the future, the greater the accessibility, but we are talking about over 2 billion people. And that access to that technology, I think we have to begin to get more computers into our schools, for example, where, you know, there aren't that many computers in the schools at all, you know. So it's also coming to understand and really having access to what those uses of that technology are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I am checking if there are more questions from the online uh, audience. And I see, okay, I see here, uh, okay, a uh, question 
post by uh, post for Mandy Rukuni, but he has left. The two other speakers could still tackle the question, I believe. So I, I will I will read this this comment by Professor uh, Okaka. He refers to to Africa, but maybe he uh, but maybe this this question can can still apply for for Latin America and um, in South Asia. So I will just read his his comment. Um, okay, we know that Africans uh, know that we could be stronger together if sovereign states surrender more autonomy to the collective, such as the African Union continentally and through regional bodies like the East African Community and the Southern African Development Community, Economic Community of West African States, for instance, a number of common protocols and agreements have been signed, but still there is little activation of, of the protocols in practice or even willingness of states to um, trust each other. I have a feeling that would, we would like to think African, but yet we still function as Anglo, Anglophones, Francophones, Lusophones, and now uh, Chinophones referring to, to China. Uh, how can Africa or in this in this case, if you find parallels with uh, Latin America or, or South Asia, how do your regions overcome these colonial obstacles and sovereign mistrusts in order to stand up on its own as a united uh, continent, as a united region that can negotiate, for a dignified space on the table, rather than um, always being in the menu, as President Rutu humorously put it. I think, uh, I think that you know, wherever the case might be, as long as you have, and we always will have, an international balance of power people will always define themselves against it in terms of either you're for one country or for another, or you are disposed towards one or the other, or even if you try to be independent, like the non-aligned movement did, you could not have non-alignment without a Cold War. You had to have that balance of power before you could define yourself in terms of non-alignment. I mean, the other point, of course, is, is that, you know, we talk about Anglophones, Francophones, Lusophones, and all of that. In the South Asia of the polity, we have parliamentary democracy and all of that now for over, you know, after almost sort of, you know, 200, and 200 years or more of Western colonial domination, we now have independence of 75 years. It's part of our own culture in that respect. It's not anymore a question of sort of saying that, look, if you're for parliamentary democracy or something like that, you are an Anglophone. We've also done it for the last 75 years. And so there is a part of it which we can call our own, if not the entirety of it as well. So I think we also have to try to move away from those colonial categorizations, if we are to move ahead. Thank you. Uh, Professor Leger, some comments on these uh, questions? Um, just very quickly, uh... Um, I think the question um, touched upon a number of very, very interesting issues. And it seems to me the possibilities of decolonial directions for citizen empowerment um, meet up against uh, the same obstacle over and over again in, in the Latin American context. And that has to do with the uh, the very pronounced presidentialist or interpresidentialist nature of of regional organizations and, and regional multilateralism, uh, starting with the fact that at the domestic level, um, the nature of republican regimes from one country to another 
has concentrated uh, dec decision making authority in the hands of presidents, and this, uh, with few exceptions, uh, this is a general rule across across Latin America. So, foreign policy, and by extension, um, what happens in regional decision making, um, is perceived as uh, an elitist uh, prerogative of of presidents of the region. Now, what I've seen that's um, I think has offered some hope is is that uh, the institutional basis of of this type of interpresidentialism is is principally informal regional organizations, and I can list a large number here: CELAC, the Community of Latin American Caribbean States, um, Pacific Alliance, uh, to name to name just two of these organizations. Uh, these interpresidentialist organizations depend on for their continuity on a a web of agency which includes not just presidents but potentially a number of other networks of actors transgovernmental actors uh networks of experts um private sector uh linkages so there are opportunities here for these different actors often to uh, to help push the agenda of these organizations. But of course, this, this depends from one, one organization to another. Uh, but basically, I think, I think this is a, a very, very powerful obstacle. Um, as long as we continue to see this reliance on this type of organizations, um, it's very, very hard to push, um, to push for a, a, a more open, um, democratic participatory type of complex multilateralism. Having said that, in, in in the short term, I think this also reinforces why it's so important um, for different United Nations organizations uh, to be playing such an important role in pushing the uh, the Sust sustainable development goals agenda in the region. Um, and here I'm thinking. Uh, for example, of the regional collaborative platform in Latin America and the Caribbean, I think it's precisely this uh, this set of different global organizations and some regional partners, such as the Economic Commission on Latin America and the Caribbean, um, through their own governance orchestration efforts that open spaces for um, for different non traditional actors uh, to par participate in complex multilateralism. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much yeah. for your insights. Mm -hmm. I think we can still, yeah, we have six minutes. I think we can still address this question, which is really related to, to uh, what uh, Professor Leger and, and uh, Dr. Saravanamoto uh, talked about. Um, uh, so James Perkins asks, so, uh, do you consider that the problem that multilateralism is facing is currently is the fact that it it focuses too much on states, whereas it needs to be focused more on 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 people? Well, I yes, I I, I sorry, did no, you, go ahead. Did you Yes, no, um, go ahead. without a doubt, uh, but I think here. I think what we're seeing is uh, the importance of a symbiosis because, um, I mean, certainly if we look at just purely civil society actors, that opens possibilities for uh, transnational advocacy networks um, and other types of um, uh, transnational movements. Uh, but there's always a coordinating challenge and there's always the challenge of of access to uh, different resources that are required. So it seems to me in this regard, uh, there is this interdependence, the need for precisely this type of governance orchestration that is done by uh, a number of specialized agencies of the United Nations or regional development banks in Latin America um, and the like. So, uh, and, and I think it's encouraging to see the move that what's taking place in this regard. And uh, once again, the the uh, looking at this possibility of a para diplomacy, 
uh, I had written in my comments here, it seems to me that we're seeing an emerging multilateral paradiplomacy so that there, there's actually um, this orchestration, uh, this facilitation by different uh, regional and global organizations uh, that creates a, a valuable space for these non-traditional actors um, to articulate their interests uh, much more effectively and influence uh, global policy and global decision-making. Mm -hmm. Professor Saravanamoto, do you have some um, uh, insight regarding the, uh, the, the this, this issue you know, that multilateralism is focused to perhaps too much on states and should be focused on, on, on people? Well, I think in a sense, it's a bit of a false dichotomy because, you know, as long as you have states or you, and, or as long as you can find, you cannot find an alternative for states, you really can't function as both in terms of multilateralism or regionalism or whatever, you know. So I think the two have to work together, as Professor Leggett said, we're talking about a symbiosis. And uh, that's what we need to foster as much as possible so that, you know, we move from the whole sort of notion of conflict, we move from that, we scale it down to competition and cooperation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see that there are more questions from the audience. Uh, perhaps we can just close very quickly with the very last uh, question. Um, what do you think would be the lessons that can be drawn from the practices and uh, and experiences in this case Latin America and South Asia that could offer insights or recommendations for better uh, cooperation and coordination in fulfilling common agendas at the multilateral level for example advancing the sustainable development uh, goals well i think at the end of the day all states, irrespective of their resources and their power capabilities, have to recognize that living in the international system, you have to be able to balance the arguments or the interdependence, and that you have to combine, you have to try to reconcile the two in order to move towards peace and prosperity. Thank you. I I just like to close by saying I, I I think in the Latin American context there's been something of a uh, of an irony, which is that traditionally Latin American governments and Latin Latin American governmental actors at the regional level have emphasized the importance of creating regional multilateral forums for political consultation. Uh, but none of the present options are strong enough to serve as mechanisms for coordinating collective action on the sustainable development goals. I think this therefore puts the onus largely on global multilateral organizations uh, to fill this gap. And in, in this regard, then I think it's very, very important. The organi organizations that comprise the regional collaborative platform in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, the UN specialized agencies and 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 their regional organizational partners uh, have a crucial role to play here in terms of attempting to org orchestrate but not control um, the uh, the multitude of different actors um, that there are in in the Latin American regional context, and at the same time, just to reinforce uh, the need to think outside the box, is if there are these. Um, log jams or these impasses in in the uh, the more uh, the more traditional multilateral organizations that we find, or the more interpresidentialist ones, uh, we need to learn, therefore to look at non-traditional actors, uh, coalitions or networks of subnational actors 
cities, uh, what I want, uh, what I just referred to a second ago as multilateral paradiplomacy. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think uh, now it's time to to close this this session. But uh, before doing it, I would really like to give a warm thank to our three panelists for their remarkable contributions and 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 insights. I also thank the online public that have has accompanied us in this first panel discussion of this second day of the. ICRA conference. Uh, I hope you will join the rest of the events prepared for today at two and at seven. So thank you very much and goodbye. See you later. Thank you. Thank you.